Thank you very much for joining us. We got a very special guest here on Moonlight. This is a uh, uh, this is the man we have to blame for everything. Um, George Schricker, who's uh, quite a fixture uh, around Plymouth and especially in the uh, uh, we'll say the creative community around Plymouth. Um, and you've uh, you've had your hands in in a lot of different creative projects down through the years, George. And I thought maybe we could start with uh, um, with some of that with some of the um, the different types of performances that you've done, um, the different uh, phases of your life that have been dedicated to to performance and to art. Well, uh, there's a. It, it's interesting. There's a picture of me in a a suit with a kind of a, a what is that called? A, a like a taxi cap or a a, a, pay, a a newsboy's cap, kind of like with a newsboy cap, and in a suit, all dolled up, on the front steps. Uh, on Walnut Street, a half a block from here, or a block and a half or something like that from here, and uh, there's a picture of me, and it, I look like I'm, I'm going to be like George M. Cohen or something, you know? Yeah. It looks like I'm ready to start start producing right there. Yeah. That, that, that picture, and I think that, uh, you know, indi- it, sort of indicative of, you know, the way my life's gone. It's It sort of feels like that. And uh, you... You came to music a, a little bit late in life, but you were already a, a dedicated writer and poet. Um, it, what are some of your experiences in in that realm? In the coming late in life, or? in the in the writing and in the poetry and oh, performance. Oh well, oh yeah, I was really, um, I was really a poet first uh, in college and in high school. I started poetry. Really, in fourth grade, I started writing poems, and uh, but then I got much more serious in high school. Um, uh, and primarily motivated by falling in love, you know, a number of times and, and, and having that unrequited. So it was really, it was lovely to, to experience those first, whatever throws of, of motivation. It makes a nice, uh, a nice diary to look back on. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. So, uh, so I wrote poems, um, and, um, and started reading more poetry and becoming more serious about that. But it wasn't until college where I really became serious of it, serious about it, and started writing uh, and reading, having uh, poetry readings, uh, doing that in open mic situations, and uh, just, you know, where you'd submit a sheaf of poems and they let you read at the bookstore, you know. Mm-hmm. So I started doing that and um, published a couple chapbooks uh, and uh, little little poetry chapbooks. Yeah. A- and um, t- I... I moved around the country, and I, I, I read my poetry in New York City, in Greenwich Village, and um, I read it in uh, Washington, D.C., in at uh, Folio Bookstore, which was used to be a kind of famous place uh, uh, there, and um, uh, and in, in uh, Indianapolis, uh, at the in- Indianapolis Museum of Art, I read several times and taught uh, creative writing there, too. So uh, it was a great... Uh, it was a great sort of beginning in poetry, and um, and it wasn't until I finally ended up in uh, in Washington D.C. when I was in Washington that a friend had an old Gibson, and uh, I, I always struggled when I was younger. I, I you know I picked up guitar, try I wanted to play, you know, but uh, I had trouble with a jump from D to G, D to G, you know, and it was a hard jump. And uh, also I had a, the guitar that. I'd been given to practice on had really high action, mm-hmm. so it really hurt my fingers a yeah. lot. And I thought, how does anybody do this? Yeah. But then this guy gives me this Gibson, and the action was real smooth, you know, real low and b- 
beautiful. Yeah. And so I'm, I said, oh, I think I could learn on this. So I, he let me uh, kind of do that, and that's how I got started. Right. Yeah. Um, boy, starting is the worst. There's, yeah, yeah. You, but you, it, you can't make anything sound good until you already know something. Yeah, yeah I guess that's true. Um, and, yeah, you, and you play a lot of uh, covers. You play a lot of covers you yeah. know, as you're trying to learn, you know. And uh, so, you know, I remember being uh, being very attracted to, like, uh, songs like uh, House of the Rising Sun and uh, and then folk songs, a lot of folk songs. Um, but the thing that really, I think, motivated me uh, to, to write songs was starting to listen in college. I started to listen to uh, folk singers, and I started to uh, go to to hear them at Amazing Grace Coffee House in Evanston, Illinois. And um, it, you know, I never never imagined I'd ever pick up the guitar and start writing songs, but I just absorbed everything in that place. And it was, uh, you know, I got to see Odetta, a great musician by the name of Dave Bromberg, John Prine, Steve Goodman, um, all these, uh, Arlo Guthrie, all these really interesting people, and they were all you know, just right there. I was just, you know, feet from them, watching them in an intimate space, much like Wild Rose Moon. Yeah. Well, so. you've, you've mentioned that place uh, frequently as sort of a model yeah. for what you wanted for Wild Rose Moon. And uh, while I was in college, I listened also closely. I had a lot of folk. I was more, much more into folk than, say, uh, rock. Uh, and uh, always blending toward or bending toward being a lyricist. Interested in musical theater, um, I had done some musical theater in high school and really enjoyed it. But you know how Rodgers and Hammerstein are with lyrics; they're just incredible. Right. And um, so you, you know, to me that 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 all these genres blended together. But when I first heard the early recordings of Pete Seeger, that's what did it for me. It was like Pete's voice was so authentic, and so believable and natural. It had a kind of a natural sound, and you know, as opposed to like a pop or produced sound. Right. Yeah. And I just fell in love with him. So you you mentioned seeing yourself as a lyricist. Um, when when did you start seeing your I'll say your poetry as relating to music? Does that go back to elementary? Um, that you you pictured maybe there's some music in this, or does that come later? I don't think so because my poetry uh, I was. Um, the the kind of poetry I did was performance poetry, mm-hmm. so it was already geared toward uh, the oral, you know, sense of things. So, you know, I ha- I wrote a lot of interesting pieces uh, that I did in in the village, Greenwich Village, and they were orchestrated around actually having the whole audience uh, be parts of the poem, and I'd like pass things out and do you know it was it was kind of performance right. art yeah but we were all in it together you know and that's how that's how i felt i felt best i think it was easiest to get up in front of people doing this as long as i knew everybody else was going to you know come along with me yeah you know? right so it was it was great so i you know created these various poems where the audience actually had a role right yeah um so they were fun yeah there's um there's a lot to that i mean like just the audience clapping means that they're part of the show in a way. And when, when they're part of a show, then everything you do is just is pure joy and they love it all because they're part of it. I know. That's what I love about the audiences at the moon. They're, I mean, without the audiences, you wouldn't have these great performances. Right, yeah. And, the, and it takes great audiences to have great performances. And boy, I'll tell you, Wild Rose Moon has great, great audiences. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if there are 30 in the house or their or the house is full. It doesn't matter. It they're same quality. It's just amazing the listening attention that's here. Right. Um, yeah, we got a lot of people that come in, travel a distance to be at the open mic that we yeah. do here to perform there um, because they they can't find an audience like this anywhere else. Right. Do you want to hear a song? Um. Sure. Okay. Um. I'd like to do a song that I wrote um in, on a, a what, my third album. Uh, with third children's album because I started as a children's performer and you know I think I felt somewhat hamstrung by uh, my 
you know, I, I knew I had certain abilities on the guitar, but they would be limited. And so I think that it would, felt natural for me to gravitate toward folk and, um, and children's music uh, in that way. So I got, to, um, I got to Orchard Country Day School. I had a residency there. And this was back a long time ago in the glory days of what I believe was uh, the uh, performing art uh, world because um, the uh, federal government had given the uh, National Endowment for the Arts uh, a, a big chunk of change to do arts in the schools. And so I was part of that program, which later got cut. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I did um, 55 residencies in schools um, and these would be all the way from five to 20 day residencies and we got paid pretty well and we got put up in people's houses and you know I was actually able to support my family on that living it was amazing yeah and who could do that now it would be very difficult so um, anyway I go to Orchard Country Day I'm working in kindergarten and they say to me, uh, I say, I say, hey, we got to write a song together. We're going to write a song. That's what I'm here for, right? And so I said, what do you want to write a song about? You know, basically, I, that's what I do. Go into the classroom. What do you want to write a song about? They said, we want to write a song about Leafy, they said. And I said, well, who is Leafy? And they said, Leafy is this maple tree. They didn't say maple tree. They just said tree. But uh, is this tree... Uh, out on the playground, and we have adopted the tree. And I said, oh, that's great. You want to write a song about Leafy? So I said, well, what would you like to say to Leafy? And they all sat in front of me, and I, they, and, uh, I said, now we have to go one at a time, okay? So they, they all raised their hand. So I, I'd pick a hand, and they'd say, well, I think I'd, I'd like to be able to walk with Leafy. Okay, so I write this down, right? And uh, and I and I got the details about Leafy and write all this stuff on the blackboard and so this is the song that came out of that and I'll, uh, maybe I'll have time to talk a little bit about it because I think the song is about way more than just a tree on the playground. Okay, and yep. you're gonna do it with me, right? Sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'll do a little turn around and then get in. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Leafy is a maple tree, gray and green and tall. He stands out on the playground, winter, spring, and fall. Branches growing left and right, sometimes full of seeds. If I could speak to Leafy, I'd tell him of my dreams. I wish that you could walk with me upon the forest path. I wish that you could talk with me and sing and dance and laugh. I wish that you could hold my hand and hug and play and smile, but I know you are a maple tree, I'll probably have to wait a while. are growing, they feed him very well. I hope his sap is flowing, he encounters no dry spell. I imagine my dear Leafy with eyes and hair and lips. Walk with me upon the forest path. 
I wish that you could talk with me and sing and dance and laugh. I wish that you could hold my hand and hug and play and smile. But I know you are a maple tree. I'll probably have to wait a while. worked on that before the show didn't we yeah thank you it, it makes it a little hard for me to listen to everything that you're singing about though um oh but it's that's fine i that's a it it is more than just words it um, is, isn't it yeah you can hear the it's a very plaintive song right and uh the, uh, the thing i wanted to say about it was uh and perhaps because i was uh, a father on the road at the time that i wrote this but I thought about, and this really takes place, you know, since medieval times in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that was the beginning of uh, the time when fathers were sort of brought out of the household, right? And so they would they leave and, and, and take jobs and go away from the house, and then they come home, and, you know, women stayed home and fixed everything. But up till then, in the medieval times, there was this kind of shared thing going on between man and uh, wife and they were kind of raising the kids together and the kids would go out in the fields and work and they do this and they so it was a you know more of a, a kind of apprentice sort of deal and um, but that shift I think come shows up in this song by the fact that not one child imagines this tree to be a she hmm. interesting and I think that signals that the father archetype, which is a big idea of the father, basically, mm -hmm. is something that um, really, uh, you know, uh, is a kind of missing archetype. It has, it has some holes in it uh, for the American psyche. And I think that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a problem, and I think we see that. Yeah. So I, th I thought that's what the song really, uh, that's how I see the song, as a kind of plaintive Search call to the it, father yeah. to say, I need your help. I need you to walk with me. I need you to talk with me. I need, I need that, you know, that kind of leadership and directorship from, yeah, the, right. from the father archetype. Um, is that, uh, since you're working with kids and, and uh, they're writing the songs with you, or I mean, they were anyway. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's, a, that's a frequent thing. Um, do you, um, do you see that theme or do you see other themes of like, um, loss or struggle 
in these these innocent things that the kids create? You know, I I think of songwriting um, like I think of art, um, and I see it more in the Wild Rose Moon than I see it have ever seen it before in my life, um, and and it's just come clearer to me um, that uh, you know human humans can open to what is best in them and part of what i think is best about being a human uh if we work at it is a kind of empathetic relationship to others right a mm -hmm. kind of empathy to right. to them and uh lord knows i have to practice this all the time but i'm just saying um so when art is working well for me i feel it's a uh, a, a collective effort um, and I don't feel, uh, I feel as if the effort or the spirit of the art is guiding the direction of the song. So if, and so that's partly just being able to read and tune in to what's in this, what's in this class. What mm -hmm. are these, what, how does this feel? How does this class feel? Yeah. And I think that feeling comes across in the song. So you end up writing a song that's very tailor-made to the class. Right. And so that if you would take that song, which we often did, and those kids would take the song and learn the learn some kind of uh, movements to it and do you know some parts and various kind of things, then we'd take it to performance in front of the whole school, right? Mm -hmm. So when the when this class is doing the song, it's just they have this incredible ownership over it because they've been so much a part of growing it, you know, in the right, classroom. Right. And I think that's really important to the process. And I think that's what shapes the nature of the song. It's mm -hmm. almost like this, the children call forth the song. Right. Does that make sense? Well, you say, you say they have, a, <clears throat> excuse me, like a process of growing it, um, which means when you're performing it, then part of themselves is in it and in the performance of it. And, right. and if the whole school is loving it, then, I mean, I, I would imagine that that's what they feel is like all that love of the school for the performance is that's love for me. Yeah. And it's just so great because it's sort of like everyone <clears throat> gets to be special, mm -hmm. I think. Um, in the storytelling uh, workshop that I created uh, that I've done at Indiana University School of Ed and uh, and and did in many many residencies. The whole design of that is to get a classroom cooperating, you know, creatively and collectively, so that they're all strengthening each other's abilities. Right. And I think those cooperative uh, techniques are really needed, so that people learn how to, you know, use empathy. I mean, empathy is is a, w one of the greatest gifts to the uh, human condition. And but but you have to sensitize yourself to it, right? So, um, so I think it's matter. Art is often a matter of of just increasing one's empathy and opening up to the fact that the you know everybody's got ideas. Let's get going. Um, soon we're gonna have to get another song in here oh, yeah. and wrap things up. But I wanna I wanna ask one other question, and maybe what you're saying about empathy is part of this. Mm -hmm. But. Um, you talked about getting into performing for children, yeah. And you gave one reason, which was that um, it's okay if you're not a master on yeah, your instrument. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, maybe you hinted at another reason that there was money available. So if you want to do this as a living, right. devote your life to it, then that was a, an avenue. Um, but is there something else that drew you initially to to performing for children? I think uh, children are closest to to a kind of sacred space that we forget as adults. And um, so, you know, I was a person who needed to be close to that space, mm -hmm. to, feel, um, to feel my voice mattered, to feel my voice mattered. You know, it's, it's hard uh, in the culture to be uh, an idealist. Right. It's hard to be an idealist. But I am one. Yeah. And I just learned, you know, I, I believe humans are supposed to evolve. We're here to evolve. We're here to learn and to deepen to ourselves. And certainly we're not here to hate each other. Right. You know, we're here to learn how to be the best together. You know, one of the illustrations, this is in science fiction. They often picture a world where 
people are a little more rational and fair with each other. And I, I think that's one of the reasons I write science fiction. But I believe that's possible. I believe that, that, you know, and I will believe that till my dying day, that it's possible for the human to evolve and, and uh, realize its potential. Yeah. But we're not. We're a long way from there. Right. <laughs> and, but, but it's still possible. There's still, and I'll talk about that next, yeah. next half yeah. hour. Well, a, a, a lover of, uh, of potential sure ought to be a lover of children. Yeah, yeah. But well, I guess so. You you got an, another tune? I don't. want I do, cut and this is here. directly from my uh, uh, my glorious uh, our glorious son, our glorious son. My wife is here, uh, Ezra. Uh, although he claims he doesn't remember saying this, but I believe that at three years old, we're in a special zone, and people just around about three, they get in a special zone, and they get access to like the universe and what it has to teach you. And all of a sudden, you say something, and it is just, you know, a three-year-old can say something that's absolutely wise, absolutely wise. So he spoke a couplet to me. It was during the first Gulf War. He was li- we were listening to it a little bit on the radio. We didn't have a television. And um, he was listening, and, uh, you know, he knew that I was not a, a proponent of war. I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I believe in peace. I believe that we should pen, spend as much time and as much money and as much effort building peace in the world as we do making war. If we did that, we would have war. So I think it's crazy that we do this. Anyway, so, but I, I th- he came out and he said this couple, he said, turn the world upside down, he said, shake it all around. Let the bombs and the missiles and the guns and the stuff fall right to the ground. He said that. And I said, that's a song. And I ran to the old (laughs) Apple computer, you know, the early, early Apple. And we sat down at it. I sat down at it, and the song literally just wrote itself. Bingo. And that's that's why I thought, okay... I just see how that works. I'm just riding on what he's throwing at me. And then it spins around. And so he's sort of like the trajectory of this. Are you ready? I'm ready. I owe this song to Tom Paxton. When my son was only three, he was playing on the floor. There were blocks and trucks and purple pigs and cows and dinosaurs. We built a castle with a king and a queen and a train with a big caboose. When a funny grin crept over his face, that's when his song cut loose. Turn the world upside down, shake it all around. Let the bombs and the missiles and the guns and the stuff Fall right to the ground Gather them in a pile Oh, that pile would stretch a mile And send them out to space So love can have its place I thought about the things he said And I wondered at them too all seem so naive to me, yet indeed they did ring true. For I'd heard the news on the radio, and I'd read every last headline. And I didn't have a better cure, so I sang it one more time. Turn the world upside down, shake it all around. Let the bombs and the missiles and the guns and the stuff fall right to the ground gather them in a pile that pile would stretch a mile and send them out to space so love will have its place well my son and I walked over to the globe we took it from its stand Both of us just shook and shook the big oceans and the land. 
And to my surprise, as we looked on that pile, it started to grow. And my son's bright eyes looked up at me. He said, Dad, I told you so. Turn the world upside down. Shake it all around. Let the bombs and the missiles and the guns and the stuff fall right to the ground. Gather them in a pile. That pile would stretch a mile and send them out to space so love could have its place. Turn the world upside down. Shake it all around. Let the people all be free of all this misery. Take all this awful fear and get it out of here. Let the children lead the way, then love. We're going to have another episode coming up here at 8 o'clock, so don't go anywhere. Um, we got a, a lot more uh, of this man who's um, meant a lot to to me and to, uh, to uh, as I said, Plymouth and the creative arts community here. So thank you, George, for everything. We're looking forward to the next Thank spot. you, John. Yep. <laughs> everybody for watching the Wild Rose Moon Moonlight series. We've got another episode coming up in a little bit. I have to thank the Gibson Foundation, Gibson Insurance, Marshall County Community Foundation, and the Marshall County Tourism for making this all happen, along with uh, George Schricker, John Baylor, Jennifer Reed, Howard, and myself, Ryan Muir. Have a good night. We'll see you soon.